We are excited that you've joined us here on YouTube for a great message today that the Lord would use to touch your life. We are excited that you could now subscribe and get several messages that would be, impact your life, whether it is our assistant, Pastor Pierre Cannings, or myself, your Pastor Paul Cannings. And we are glad to serve you. We can also continue this process but not only are you subscribing by going to our website. When you go to our website, you could get engaged in our ministries and be able to become engaged in what we're doing here at Living Word Fellowship Church so we get a chance to be a part of your life to grow you. And not only that, we've got a book that will be able to help you to go from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity. What are the steps? How do you get there? How do you know you're there, what the fruit of the Spirit looks like? These different things will take place when you get engaged in our website and learn more about us and be able to give. Five ways to give when you get to a website, it explains that. And by doing so, we're able to not just touch your life, but the folks at Living Word. We're able to go across the world for the glory of God by those who subscribe like you will subscribe in impacting lives. So join us again. As more messages are rolled out or you go to messages already there, you're able to see God grow in your life because His Word becomes a viable mechanism to not just know Him, but to experience Him. Come back. Let us grow together. Living Word. I approach this sermon with in fear and trepidation because I know how heavy this might get. So I do pray that you will buckle in. But also, it's not hard to comprehend, but there is some philosophical debate, some theological conversations we have to have today. Pastor has allowed me the privilege to preach what I want, and this came to my heart months ago. So I'm thankful that I get a chance to express my heart because this is something that sometimes I even wrestle with. Um, and before I even dive into the Word of God, I'll be very quick to say this. How many of you have ever said, if I ever see Adam and Eve, it's on sight? <laughs> I mean, just, just, I'm dead serious. Look, how many of you have ever, and I repeat, ever have said, man, if I just, if I see, if Adam made it, I'm, I'm punching that dude in the face. If Eve gets in, it's fixing to go down. And, and I'm here to contend with you philosophically that you're wrong. Because I believe you would have made the same mistake. I believe I would have made the same mistake. And I'm going to prove it to you. Not only scripturally, that it would have happened no matter what, but I'm going to prove it to you that many of us would have fallen for the same thing. So what I would love for you to do before I even pray and walk us through this word, although I'm going to try to lighten up the philosophy, I want you to understand our theology. I want you to understand that we're all guilty of this one sin. However, you can go to your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. You're going to start in verse 15, and we're also going to go to chapter 3, but it's not a far turn. So Let's just dive into the Word of God. I, I told you I'm excited, but I approach this sermon with fear and trepidation. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, you know I need you to expound upon the Word of God that is powerful, that is deep, that is deeper than I could ever be. So therefore, you said through the Holy Spirit, you, the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God as God himself and the triune God. So therefore, I ask that through the Holy Spirit, you will give me your mind, that everything I say comes from your direct thought, that I don't put Pierreisms into this sermon, that it is a, a strict glorification of who you are, but also applicable to the people in which we serve. God, I need you today as we try our best to dissect also to take apart, but also introspectively look at ourselves through the conviction of the Holy Spirit so that we can, I repeat, we can leave different than we came in. God, so therefore I pray that you will allow me to be different as I walk in the Holy Spirit through your word. God, I love you and I need you today desperately. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I went out to eat with one of my good friends, but my good friends has uh, 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 the ability to pay for a different type of meal. Now, I'll, I'll say this. Y'all know y'all have that one friend who when you go out, to, go out to eat, you hope they pay. Because they always pick restaurants that are outside of the range, but you want to try the restaurant, but you can't pay for the restaurant. You ever been there and you just praying? Like, you, 
you hopefully will offer, but you already know. How many of y'all ever offered and prayed they said no? You were like, no, man, it's on me this time. you they like, nah, I got it. You're okay, man, if that's what you decide. <laughs> so my boy picked this restaurant I'd never been, and I walked in and I already knew I was out of place. There are certain ways in which you know you out of place. I'm not going to say how you know, but I knew. And I walked in, and I was like, uh-oh. Then I opened the menu, and I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> but he already told me that he was going to cover the meal. But now I'm going to talk about some etiquette real quick, and I got to speed this joker up. What if you know somebody paying for your meal? What's the proper etiquette, ladies and gentlemen? What do you wait for them to do? Yes, you do. Why do you wait for them to order? To see how much they spend and then you spend underneath. It ain't your card, ladies and gentlemen. You don't get to pick above what they get to pick. So what do you say? Even though this is my boy since college, what did I say? Hey, bro, what you getting? He was like, man, I'm thinking about get the half and half. I looked at the menu. I was like, well, there's a plethora of options underneath this, this little order he just did. But I looked at the menu, then the waiter comes. I know, I'm sorry. And he comes and he says, hey, <laughs> as I told you, I was a couple of ways I knew I was out of place. He's like, oh, enjoy your menu, um, but we have off the menu items. And I was like, <laughs> okay. I didn't say anything, play it cool. He was like, first, I would like to offer you our crab deck -lick 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 -lick. I was like, oh, that's good. <laughs> Didn't know what he said. And then he was like, I'd like to offer off to you our lobster deck. And I was like, ooh, deck is sec tech, ooh. <laughs> and then finally he got, he was like, and we also have, just letting you know, our finest fish off the market. It, it, it's, it's something only caught in the Atlantic. And he was like, I'd like to offer you the sec tech, sec tech, tender sec. I was like, ooh. But then I looked at my friend and said, what you order? And he was like, right here. I said, well, let me get back to the menu. <laughs> because he paying. See, when people offer us off the menu things, it entices us because we can't see it. If somebody else is already paying, you have the plethora of options in front of you. Some of us just get caught off guard or want what we can't see. Also, we want what we can't have. So even though we know our friend, Jesus Christ, has not offered anything off the menu, but he's willing to pay for everything he's given you, we still listen to somebody offering us stuff off the menu. How do many of us get caught into sin? It's that somebody offers us what God says we're not supposed to do. But since God said we're not supposed to do it, some of us will at least lend an ear to somebody offering something that we haven't heard or seen before. So even though we can't define it ourselves, even though we already know it's off the menu, even though we already know that the menu has a plethora of options, we still give ear to, pay attention to, and even desire things we can't even see the results to. Because some of us found out the results after we ordered off the menu, ladies and gentlemen. Let's be honest and transparent. Some of us have ordered off that man menu, and we was like, I don't know the results, but when you saw the results and they described it to you, it was like, ooh, that sounds good, only for that man to come around. And you was like, I don't like the menu no more. Well, you should have stuck to the menu because God told you what a good man was. God told you what a good woman was. God told you what marriage looked like. God told you what a husband's supposed to do. But many of us are like, I'm going to try this off the menu price. And God's like, I didn't pay for that. But go to Genesis chapter 2 and you're going to find the same scripture that you already know I'm going to. But I want you to pay attention to the Hebrew. Because if you pay attention to the Hebrew, you're going to be like, man, maybe I am Adam. Maybe I am Eve. Watch and pay attention to the setup. In verse 15, it said, the Lord God took. Now, we already know he created everything. But this weird word comes into play. That means when he made Adam, he placed him in the garden. He didn't necessarily have to make him in the garden, but he took him there. He, watch these words, says, he took the man and put him. Oh, I love God for this. 
and please pay attention for a second, that it was God who put him there. You're like, Pierre, that's not important, but it is. Because you can't put yourself in the garden because only the creator can put you there. You can't make your marriage work. Only the God who created marriage can make it work. You can't make yourself a better person. Only God can put you there. So therefore, some of us have been trying to create our own gardens only to realize your garden ain't that good. So sometimes we blame God for places he didn't even put you. We're saying, God, the garden you promised me ain't that good. And God's like, but I didn't even put you there. You put yourself there. So why are you blaming me for somewhere I never put you? Mm. But I'm not just talking about your jobs and your marriage and your singleness today. I'm talking about life. That some of us have put ourselves in life circumstances that God said that ain't the garden. But watch the word for put. Because if I give you the definition of put, you'll be like, well, maybe I can define what the garden was supposed to do to me. Because put doesn't mean he just kicked them and punted them in there. Put means that is a place, watch these words, of rest. Oh, this is good. It says it's the same word used later on when Noah, when the waters receded, and it said Noah was put in verse in chapter 5, verse 29. Then you have Genesis 1 through 11. It's talking about the safety of Israel, and it talks about they would have rest from the land of their enemies. So when God puts you somewhere, it is supposed to, watch these words carefully, it's supposed to be a place where you can find rest in. God, yes, you're like, well, Pierre, what about my enemies? Very good point. But when you do it the Lord's way and before sin was created in and you allow sin to enter in, you can still find rest in the presence of your enemies because God put you there. How do I know that? Let's go to Israel because Israel had to beat up all them enemies around them. But if they would have done it the right way and done it what God said in the promised land, would they have experienced the enemies coming back into their land or would they have found rest? That many of us, even though God has put us in the right things, we invite the enemy in and then complain about God that we don't have rest in the spot. We'll we'll enter into a marriage and God's like, that's a good marriage, but then we'll let sin enter in and complain about the spot. No, you let sin enter in. You let your attitude come in. You let everything else come in. You invited people in. You invited voices in. And now you're mad about the spot you created? No, enjoy your spot. If you ain't going to till your own garden, don't be complaining when you got weeds. If you ain't going to work the way God told you to work, and we're going to get to that in a second. If you're not going to enjoy what God has given you, the question you have to ask yourself is, do you like the garden he put you in? Because this one gets tricky because he tells them where he put him. He said, I put you in the garden of Eden. That means there is a place. The word put not only means place of rest and delivery from enemy or a place where you don't have the presence of anything. It also means he told him where he put him. Where did he put him, ladies and gentlemen? You know the story because everybody wants to go back there. It's the garden of Eden. Everybody, people trying trying to find it on a map because they want to get back to the garden of Eden. Why? Because the garden of Eden had what? everything that they would need to live. It was called, the Garden of Eden was also known for being fertile, an oasis. It had a garden of God. It was luscious. It was peaceful. Look up scriptures throughout the text, Isaiah 5, 13, Ezekiel 28, 13, 31, 9. It describes the Garden of Eden, but God described it for himself in Genesis of how good everything was with the absence of sin. You would want to be there, ladies and gentlemen. How many of us have those little Instagram friends that always go on vacation talking about you would want to be here? I'm telling you the Garden of Eden is better than your vacation spots because they pay for that with a credit card, so it really wasn't a vacation spot. But it's moving on. This is better than that, but there was two trees present. And uh, there was one tree in the middle. We'll talk about that in a second. But even in the midst of the garden, there was two trees. But there was also a plethora of trees in the totality of the garden that were fertile and were producing fruit. There was no sin. There was no rotting. There was no problems. So therefore, I am in the right spot. Here's the kicker. Is how many of us enjoy the garden that God has put us in? What if the garden is not what you want? What if the garden is something you want to change or modify? 
what if God knows we are very good and we are in a good spot with fertile ground, but many of us want to be rich? That even though you don't have all the savings account, God is still supplied for your needs and you're in fertile place. You're in the garden of Eden of your finances, but many of us are like, well, I got to have more. So we work double time, skip church, do things that we're not supposed to do with our money, going on vacations we know we can't afford because we want more. So God is like, wait a second. If I gave you everything you need, why are you still searching? I put you there. So therefore, I have to ask you a question. If God gave you everything for godliness, why are you still searching for godliness? If God gave you everything you need to live, then why are we still whole? Why do we have a hole in our hearts? Why is there vacancies in our life? Why are we asking people to fulfill what God said I gave you everything for? I put you in the garden, according to Jesus Christ, where one man's sin entered, another man came and died for it. So I gave you everything you needed. I, I provided you another fertile ground in your heart. For some reason, our hearts keep searching for other things and other people. We go out every weekend trying to find another fertile ground. Many of us are in the glove club thinking it's fertile. Oh, it's fertile, all right. <laughs> nah, y'all didn't like that one. There's always that one friend. You, how many of y'all still go to buffets? Buffets. Anybody still go? It's only one of you. That's right. That nobody goes anymore. Oh, two of us. That's good. They're starting to die off. I went back to Golden Corral for the first time like four years ago. I didn't realize how nasty it was, but let's leave that out. <laughs> I just tell you all my honest opinion. It's my sermon. It's not yours. <laughs> just because your taste buds accept mediocre, that ain't my fault. <laughs> we'll fight later. But there's always that one friend who knows the buffet line, knows exactly what they want to get and still orders off the menu. <laughs> but we have 40 options. We got a whole bunch of 40 nasty options for you. <laughs> I'm doubling down, y'all. But there's always that one friend who's like, yeah, can I see the menu? You don't need to see the menu. There's a buffet. The buffet is provided for you. It was paid for. Walk in that joker and enjoy your buffet. You know why many of us don't like the garden? It's because you stop appreciating the buffet that you had. You've been there so much, you start saying, I, I've, I've tried everything here. And God's like, wait a second. I gave you options, ladies and gentlemen. But you're still ordering off the menu. You know how, I know I told you I prove it to you biblically. Let me give you a story in the Bible. No, let's, let's chunk the illustration away and let's give you a story in the Bible. Y'all remember this, this man named Samson? Samson was dumb. You know why Samson was dumb? Because Samson had everything every man in this sanctuary want. Samson walked around, had strength for no reason. Head full of hair. Trade on, you know what I'm saying. Man, you on the same page. The strength that actually comes from our beard. Trade ons is better than mine. I see you over there, my balded brother. <laughs> Think about this. You didn't wake up, work out. This man woke up, talking about, mm, and just was in shape. <laughs> Had everything he needed. And it says all the way down, you can read it yourself in Judges 16 4. He had a weak spot. They didn't ask him to do anything. You know, it's this, his, his job description was minimal. Like, wake up, fight, go to sleep. You're going to win, fight, go to sleep. <laughs> the only thing, there's a couple things God said. Don't cut your hair. And then what did he say? Don't marry outside of what I tell you to marry. This man decides to walk down the street. First, he goes into a harlot. You can read it yourself. And then he falls in love with Delilah. Even though he had everything he needed to be successful, even though he had the job description he was supposed to have, even though his job description was already taken care of by God, that means he didn't need to do anything extra. Else. He didn't have to do push-ups, bench press. The man woke up, beat up people, went to sleep. But the fact that he wanted something 
He coveted something he wasn't supposed to have and jacked up his entire mission. How many of us are Samson, even though you don't want to admit it? That God gave you a job, but instead of staying in your job, doing what you're supposed to do, and then going to sleep, because God's going to fight your battles while he creates everything you need for life and godliness, he is going to do what he's supposed to do, but you over here talking about Delilah. That God already has somebody out there if you chose to pick according to the descriptions, if you chose to stay in the buffet line, if you chose to pick from what God had, if you chose not to order off the menu, God is saying I already has success lined up with your job. But many of us keep following Delilahs everywhere we go. What is your Delilah? Let me prove it to you. Is that everybody here was supposed to be given a job. Watch what I'm fixing to say. Because he said he put him in the Garden of Eden, and then he took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and to keep it. Oh, this one gets deep. I told you this story. I got I got I got This story is going to get better. Before sin was ever present, this man had a job. That means a lot of people say the job came after they sinned. God said, I created it so you can supervise it and keep it. So, fellas, I'm going to be honest with you. Don't come to me telling me your business plan if you ain't got a job yet. Now, I know it's going to seem very legalistic of me, and I'm going to be very careful how I present it. You can have a business plan. I mean, have a vision, start your business, be an entrepreneur. I love your heart. Keep that heart. But don't also come and say, well, I ain't got no job, and I plan to not work for 17 months to figure this thing out. No, you can't. But you know what else I'm fixing to tell you? This wasn't about occupation, ladies and gentlemen. A lot of people take this scripture and say, he has to get a job. True, that's mandated. But you know what this was more about? It's the fact that when God created you, he created you to serve him. It wasn't even about the job. It was the fact that I'm not going to sit here, create you, and you leisure amongst in the garden in which I created. I created it, you keep it. How do I know this? Because some of y'all entered in the marriage and got lazy, didn't you? And God's like, no, I created marriage, your job to keep it. I created your singleness, it's your job to keep it. I created your virginity, it's your job to keep it. I created your purity, it's your job to keep it. I'm not going to work the garden I created, you work it, I put you there. God didn't put you there to become lazy. Also, I created the relationship between me and you. You need to cultivate and you need to keep it. The problem with Christianity is that we get lazy in our faith too. It's called this word called complacency. If you know the word complacency is that means that you have think you have established yourself with God and you need no more growth. God is looking at you like, wait a second. If I created the garden through Jesus Christ, then you need to cultivate the relationship. You need to keep it. That's on you, not on me. I already made the opportunity. I put you here. Oh, we got a lot of lazy Christians, though. Come to church. Oh, that's too much. Serve in the church. Too much. And God's like, wait a second. How many things have God created? Husbands, how many things? Fathers, how many things? Wives, how many things? Mothers, how many things? I'm not even talking about your J-O-B. I'm talking about your calling and your responsibility. God has given you blessings on blessings. Some of us have grandkids and kids. Some of us have let go of what God has given. And God's like, but I gave it to you. But you have to look at the definitions for cultivate and keep. Cultivate means to what? Toilet. To get in there and work. But not with labor because remember sin, what? The ground got hard so it became harder. This job wasn't even that hard. It wasn't even that hard because the ground wasn't messed up yet. Sin jacked up the toil. Cultivate is a very simple word. It's not hard. Cultivate just simply means that you're going to till it, but watch these words next. It means you're going to serve it. You're going to serve me. So the word isn't literally just about the ground. It's about your service unto God. So because it's not just about the cultivating, because it's not, you know why? Because you can track this word all throughout the Old Testament, and it really means priestly service, that they were servicing the temple, and they're the tabernacle, and they had the duties of the Levites, that they were saying, hey, I need you to cultivate your job that I've given you through me. So therefore, your service is how you cultivate. So then I ask, how many of you, and it's going to be a very blunt conversation, is that how many of us are cultivating our relationship with God? 
Uh, how many of us just say, you know what, God is just, you know, one scripture a day, we good? How many of you are content, complacent, excuse me, with what you do in your walk with God? How many of us are saying, I'm good with where I'm at? See, everybody asks me, like me, hey, what's your New Year's resolution? I don't have one. Every day I want to wake up and get closer to my Jesus. That's it. So that means I need to change my devotions, I'll change my devotions. That means I have to change my worship, I'll change my worship. God, I want to get closer. So that if that takes longer, more time on my knees, more time in the closet, more time in my car, I'm going to do everything it takes to cultivate my service to you. Every time you preach, you go back, you listen so you can preach better. Why? Not because I want to be the best preacher. It's only when I want to cultivate what God has given me. So therefore, I ask you, how, when's the last time you cultivated your service? When's the last time you said, God, I see the gift you gave me. I see the garden you gave me. I see where you put me spiritually. Now let me cultivate that ground. Keep. Keep means to guard. That means not only do I cultivate and serve, I guard what he's given. You know, the same word has been used, if you look at your commentaries, the same word is used when they got kicked out the garden. The same word is used to say they guarded them from coming back in. Because you didn't guard what I told you to guard, now I'm going to guard you from coming back in. Oh, you got to look deeper at that same scenario. How many of us is God is saying, I gave you a job, you, choose, you chose not to do it, now you don't get it. Now you don't get it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to stop you because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Even though I created it for you, I now got to guard you from messing it up even further. So some people, I've been single for too long. Maybe God is guarding you because every time you get back in it, you don't guard yourself. Maybe God is saying, hey, look, I'm, I'm not going to open this joker back up until you change yourself. You haven't guarded our relationship ever. But now you want a relationship? That don't make no sense. Now, you can find a person that you don't have to guard with. Amen. Y'all go do y'all thing. But I'm not going to give you my daughter if you can't guard yourself. Because every time I give you my daughter, you end up not cultivating the ground well. Brother, you are not doing what I told you to do. How about you get this guard? Mm. I know. Then he goes a little deeper. He says, hey, not only did I put you there to reign, not only did I put you there to work, I want you to get this. The Lord God commanded the man. Here's the crazy part. I knew I told you I'd get into theology. This is important for you to understand. Now you're free to choose. You're free to reign, free to work. Now you're free to choose. Because the reason why the two trees exist, but a lot of people get mad like, God, watch this. I'm pretty sure you, some of y'all have said this argument. Why would you put the tree if you knew they would do, use it or get it or do whatever, right? How many of you have ever proposed that argument? First, we get mad at Eve and say, well, I got to suffer for Eve's su sufferings, right? And then we get say the next argument is, well, why would you put the tree in the garden and then command them not to eat it? Just don't put it there. Here's your theological argument for the day. If you don't put the tree of good and evil in the garden, then you don't give them free will. If he doesn't give you free will, then you have to choose him. Therefore, it's not a relationship. So you, everybody, even when they were created in full purity, that means they have not sinned yet. They were given the capacity to choose. So God is looking at you saying, hey, there is free will because I'm going to give you the capacity to choose if you want to obey me or not. Isn't that the beauty of God, not the detriment? The detriment of saying, God, you, I have to do what you want me to do. I'm a robot. I have to walk like this, talk like this. That's when we get mad at God. But then God is saying, well, I'm beautiful because I didn't make you do anything. You chose this. Free will is a beautiful thing because that also highlights grace. Hear me out. Because if I give you free will, but then I cover you with grace, you can't complain. Oh, well, I know this is theologically deep, but just bear, bear down. Because if I give you free will, that means you have the right to choose. You've chosen some bad things, but then I cover you with grace, despite the fact that I gave you free will. That's a good God. Let's be honest. 
Some of y'all are not here because you made a lot of good choices. Some of you are here because God gave a lot of grace in your choices. Some of y'all's marriage is not together because you made it and fought hard for marriage. Some of y'all are here because God's grace was enough to cover you through your problems. Some of y'all still choose wrong every day when you walk in the house with the same attitude you left with. And God's like, my grace is sufficient for that. You still choosing wrong, my grace is sufficient for that. You still have the same attitude, my grace is sufficient for that. So instead of complaining to God about your free will to choose whether you can be yourself or not, start thanking God that he gave you free will so he can cover you with grace. This tree is the example that many of us have fallen for the tree. Because how in the world could you not choose God? Here's the crazy thing about the argument. And hear me out. I told you it would be philosophical. It, if for you to have everything you need and then go to the tree. But then I look at us and I look at Pierre Cannons and say, wow, I have everything I need, but yet still are tempted by a tree. How many of us are tempted when you walk out the sanctuary? Shoot, some of us are sitting right next to our temptation. Let's go to church, baby. You, let's go to church. <laughs> I'm going to leave it alone. I co- the Lord commanded, but watch this word. It means the word the Lord said, I command. That means I give an order. <laughs> you have to believe that God is able to give orders. The problem is that when you remove the authority away from God, his orders seem like rules rather than provision. Bear with me, y'all. If you love God enough, you know that everything he orders is so that what? You can have a good relationship with him and it's going to work out for your good. But when you remove his authority, you start saying, well, then I make the free will decision because I know what's best for me, even though you created everything I Need. It is the simplest conundrum that we have created of somehow where we have fallen for the trap that God no longer can give us orders. We give ourselves orders. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Even while you make that mistake, free will. Even while some of us have said, I'm going to do me, free will. Even though God is saying, hey, man, this is how you love your wife. Hey, man, this is how you go to job. This is how you serve in church. I'm commanding you to come. Do not neglect the assembling of believers. He's saying, y'all think y'all showing up and doing God a favor. God's like, I told you to do this. I told you to love your wife. I told you to love your husband. I told you to respect your husband. These are all commands I gave you for your success, but you still picking a tree. So you got to be asking yourself, watch these words and don't tell me this ain't a good God. He commanded them saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat what? Freely. Eat, fam. Go eat. My dad, he created a rule when we got our car, 1989 Volvo. I don't know if y'all remember them jokers in the tank. I heard Wayne laugh because Wayne remember when I used to pull up to the barbershop in that Volvo. My dad had a rule, though. He said, you can't get on the highway until you're 17. Now, that sounds crazy. But he said, hey, I'm just nervous. I just want to make sure you learn how to drive first before I put you going 70 miles an hour down the road. I gave you this heavy duty. Hey, y'all remember them Volvos? Them things are tanks. I gave you this Volvo. I could protect you. My dad thought he did us a favor. Imagine pulling up to high school in a Volvo. All my friends had Mustangs. My behind's pulling up in a, in a mom car like, man, great day, huh? No, brother, it's not a great day. I was in a different side of the street, too, like, Y'all know in Jersey Village back then, a Volvo wasn't the car you wanted. I'm thankful for Monica that she came from the side, you know, the little bit of the hood, that she appreciated my car. I would even roll down the sunroof. Y'all, I had to roll it. And Monica was like, that's the breeze. I'm like, yeah. Yes, queen. She didn't know no difference. She didn't know my friends had the push button. (laughs) Find them young, ladies and gentlemen. Find them young. (laughs) They don't know no better. 
So we in the Volvo, we cruising around, and I was, she was like, where we going? I was like, somewhere on this side of town. But I'll be real with you. All my friends were on this side of town. Uh, everything I needed to do was on this side of town. And, and then my dad had the beauty to give us gas money. So we never even had to pay for gas. He just said, stay on this side of town and don't get on the highway. There were two sons. <laughs> With the same command. One was more exploratory. <laughs> the other was like, we'll bet I'll just stay on this side of town. <laughs> Oh, man. Isn't it crazy that God gives us gas and he pays for your car and he puts you in the safest car possible so you don't, if, even if somebody else makes a mistake, he can still protect you. And even though we don't like the car and the roll down sunroof, it's still a good car. Only thing he's asking is you stay on his side of town. Only thing he's asking is, hey, you're not ready to get on the highway. I need you to just obey my command. Because if you obey my command, I'm going to take care of everything you need, but don't complain if you get on the highway. That's your free will. Some of us have got on the highway going further and further away from God, but then complain that we're at a distance with God. Some of us are disobeying the command of God, knowing it's taking us in the wrong direction. But if you would stay where God commanded you to stay, you still be in the Garden of Eden yourself. That some of us marriages and singleness is so far away from God, but not because God didn't give you the provision for your singleness. It's not because God didn't give you everything you needed for your marriage. It's not because God didn't give you everything you needed with your finances. It's because you chose to get on the highway, go 70, and go as far as you could away because you wanted to explore what that tree tasted like. How do I prove it to you? This man said, I'm sorry, this God said, free, eat what you want. Think about this. There's no sin. That means every fruit you pull off the tree, you like, mm, mm. Think about how big the garden is. We're not talking about like you going to, like, it's the size of the sanctuary. You're like, man, I'm tired of that. It's the same tree I saw yesterday. Now, we're not talking about that, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about a garden made for creation. That means you were not done exploring the beauty of God's creation. And them folks said, well, what about this one right here in the middle? How do I know it? Eat, enjoy, enjoy the fertileness of the ground. I created it. But then it gets a little deeper. He says, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not. Remember, this is a command. It wasn't a suggestion. You shall not eat. I'm going to put this in my single. Singles, can I talk to you? Okay. Pick amongst my queens, but you shall not have sex with them. Only one person, only one dude was like, yeah, yeah, preach that. He married, <laughs> he like, yeah. <laughs> All my single dudes are like, mm -mm. <laughs> Ladies, you know, somebody has told us on the conspiracy that there's like only one woman out there and you just haven't found her yet. No, 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 no. There's a description of a godly woman. It tells you to go find a good wife. That's it. So, have at it. The only thing I'm asking is when you get there, do what I tell you to do. But don't get mad when you keep going through in and out of breakouts because you keep including sin in your relationship. I'm like, man, these relationships don't work. And stop throwing in the tree. Don't, don't chunk in the tree and then blame God that you're out of the garden. Because he told you, eat freely. Pick one. Have a great relationship. Marriage, am I lying? Have a great relationship. Enjoy the woman that you have chosen. Enjoy the man in which you have been blessed with. He says, hey, your body his, my body his. They even tells you, hey, y'all y'all better exchange some bodies. But then we'll go out and look at pornography. Then we'll go on our screens and our phones and look at the garden again or look at the tree. 
But God's like, I told you to eat free. This is your marriage. And so let's don't make it all about sex, but that's a good point. Is that some of us are falling for the tree. And God's like, but I gave you everything you needed not to eat. I gave you more options so you wouldn't be tempted by the one. Isn't that crazy? I gave you plethora. You only tempted by one tree. You got to be dumb. <laughs> but then I look at some of us and I look at Pierre Cannings and I say, man, Pierre, you got to be dumb. If he's giving you everything, why are you distracted with the one? But it's also the one that we can't have is the one that we want the most. Am I lying? We ain't, y'all know I'm not lying. Go on a fast and look at McDonald's later. <laughs> y'all ever been to the church fast? It's going to be in January. You're going to be like, oh, God, McDonald's smells so good. <laughs> it's the one you what? Can't have. Mm. So people always ask, what's the tree of good and evil? Why was it so bad? And people were like, well, it introduced them to what? Sin. I had to look this up theologically. I told you there'd be a couple of theological argumentations before we move on, and I'll get to my last point. I want you to get this, that the capacity to choose was given already when they were created. The tree of good and evil, it says you, it will make you like God. What it was saying was, it's simple. I will, because you have now eaten, not that you didn't know what good and evil was, you knew the tree was a bad decision, but now you are exposed to the capacity and the pull of sin. How do I know that? Try not to sin, ladies and gentlemen. And if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, that's why I don't get mad at people who don't have Jesus. They're supposed to sin. They got no capacity to stop it. The tree gave them. So you're like, well, make you like God. God doesn't sin. You're right. God doesn't sin. God doesn't know sin. God can't sin. So since he doesn't have the capacity, what did it give them? It gave them the ability to know what God was not. So now they can search out for what he's not. You know, it's crazy. And I'll say this to you in genuineness. How could you look at a tree when God was even dwelling in the garden? And I'm going to prove it to you. Watch chapter 3, verse 1. And just stay here with me for a second. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast in the field. I just want to get you to set his field, the, 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 the serpent coming. But watch verse 2, and this is where some of y'all are going to say, I would punch Eve on sight, all that stuff. But I want to make sure I set the setting right. Adam wasn't far. Okay, now I started there. But the first question you should ask The woman said to the serpent, the fruit of the tree, watch this, it says, indeed, you shall not eat from the tree. Does she have it right? He has it. Does he have it right? Yes. The woman answers him. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. Does she have it right? Look at your scripture real quick. No. What did she miss? There's this word that he missed, and Pastor Lawrence says it all the time. All means all, and that's all it means. I don't know if Pastor Lawrence is here, but I got it down. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. When you get confronted with the ability to be at the tree, let's first talk about her location. She's at the tree. Who met her there? The serpent. So therefore, that woman, excuse me, Eve, was already there, just between me and you, from brother to sister. Why in the world would you even go next to the tree? That's the only tree you can't eat from. Fam, enjoy the rest of that joker. But I also thank God for this little segment that y'all don't understand. I'm glad he put it in the middle. Because of what if God hid the free will? What if you put it in a corner guarded by angels and warning signs? No. He said, I'm going to put it here right in the center because I'm not going to hide from you your choice. That's number one. Number two, Eve was right there dead center in the middle. Can I ask you a hard question? 
before I move on? Why is it that we play with sin? We, we tiptoe around sin. You ever seen those people that fake cuss? Like, we like to tiptoe around it. We just going to lay down and cuddle for a little bit. I'm just, you know I'm lonely. <laughs> God, not all the way. Just, just, just a touch. You know I missed touch. <laughs> God, you, you know how long it's been between me and my wife. It's just one look until it sends you down a capade of pornography. It sends you down this sinning path. It, it's just the ability to, to cut him one eye to make, and remind him of who you are. I didn't, I didn't cuss him out, Jesus. I just gave him the eye. It's the toying with the sin that I don't understand. Like if you keep going around the tree, sooner or later you're going to be tempted to eat it. You can't keep going to the club and say, I don't know how I found him. You, you. It's your third club in one night. You're going to find somebody. You keep going to lounges talking about, man, I keep finding the wrong people. Fam, you're dancing around the tree. If you have a drinking problem, don't go to a liquor store. If you have a smoking problem, don't go to your link. Erase his number so you don't call the tree. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Didn't think through that. If you have a sneaky link, Erase the number out the phone because you already know you're going to be lonely. You don't think your desires are going to pop up sooner or later? You don't think you keep creeping around a tree? It ain't, it's, it's just not going to happen? But then all of a sudden, she, in the inability to see, she takes out, watch this word, y'all, and I got I to be careful. She takes out the word every. You know what I've learned about people that really want to sin? They start limiting God's freedom. Because all you're focused on is what you can't have. So guess what you start doing? Man, God, man, every, following God is hard. Every Sunday I got to be at church. Now he wants me to serve. Now Pierre's challenging us to get involved and talk to each other and make relationships. <laughs> I'm an introvert, God. I don't Gotta get out of myself. Because we start saying, wow, God, you gave me all the freedom in the world. Many of us, if I'm honest with you, you've taken out the every of your relationship with God. You've taken out so much of God's freedom that he's given you that you've limited to yourself. But I'm going to say one more little side caveat. How many of y'all have noticed we don't enjoy the garden because we're too focused on the problem. That, that many of us, hear me out, we only see the problem every day we wake up and we excuse every blessing he's given. That's why some of us came to church burdened because we're too focused on the one thing we can't have, but even though God has given you everything you need. And then we get mad at God or we're discontent with God and we're struggling with God. And God's like, but there's so many other trees. What problem right now takes your ah, attention? What issue in your life have you made God? And how do I know that? Is that some of us wake up thinking about it, can't sleep because of it. Talk to everybody about it. Repeat the same story 15 times. And your friend has to go through that same cyclical story because that was your idol in the first place. And because you can't have your idol back, some of us struggle with the fact that the garden still has every tree you need. 
Because we can't have our ex back, we forget there's trees everywhere. Because you don't have the relationship on your timeline, you forget you got trees, blessings. He woke you up this morning, as old folks say, in your right mind. You, you forget that you walked into this place knowing you sinned last night, and God's like, hmm. That's your tree. Your tree is the fact that you ain't dead. Your tree is the fact that we, God knows exactly what you did. He's given you so many blessings. But this one tree, for some reason, steals your joy. That if you don't get this tree, all of a sudden, God ain't good no more. While, it's a crazy thing, while you stand in his garden. How can God not be good if you're standing in the garden? He put you in. Second thing, just get this. It said, when we talked about the sermon two weeks ago, we said that God is possible due to the verb choice and the fact that they recognized the fact that he was walking in the garden, that he's done it before. So how in the world could you get distracted with a tree if you have the presence of God? Hear me out. Is you know why you can get distracted with your problem or the tree or the sin? It's because you don't care and value the presence of God. If you value the presence of God, why would you be next to the tree and why wouldn't you be waiting for God to walk through the garden again? Why, why, why would you even be? I would be waiting on God like, God, man, last time he came down right here. He would step on me when he came down. He'd be like, oh, my fault. Yeah, I'm here. I'm waiting. Because a God who put me in a garden and only asked me to cultivate and keep, that's the only job I got. And here's the crazy thing, ladies and gentlemen, is I didn't even get to read verse 18. It said, after he did all of this, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. So not only did you make me put me in a garden, you saw my need for companionship and created that too. So you care about me and my needs and I'm more focused on a tree? How foolish are we? So therefore, I ask the question again, what tree is in your life that you sit there and stare at all day saying, God, why can't I have it? Rather than cultivating and keeping. You know what's one thing that she wasn't doing or they weren't doing? Doing their job. Let me give you one more story. David, what was he supposed to be doing? He's supposed to be at war. He was supposed to be doing his what? Job. When they're standing at the tree, were they doing their job? No. You know, sometimes the reason why we're distracted with the tree? Because we ain't busy doing what God called us to do. That your life has become all about you in this tree. And God's like, but I gave you a job. Name all the animals, cultivate and keep. But the beauty of what God gave him is that he gave him leadership in what he created. Think about it. He didn't say, hey, man, I need you to scrub my feet when I come down. He says, I'm going to give you leadership and supremacy in creation. Some of us walking around like we low. And God's like, but you high. Anytime you get to serve me, that's a high spot. But you too busy, too distracted, can't come to church, can't serve in it, can't serve your wife, can't serve your kids. Fam, that's your job. And the reason why you're distracted over there certain on your history of your phone, because you ain't doing your job. Get up, off the couch, do your job. Get up, stop watching football, do your job. Get up, make sure that your wife is taken care of before you sit your behind down. That's your job. Because last time I checked, it's leadership, it's service. So you can't sit there and tell me you a good husband if you ain't served your wife today. Do your job. Because maybe you would know more about her needs than yours if you did your job. Maybe you would know her better. Maybe she would love you better if you did your job. So stop complaining about your tree if you ain't serving the rest of the garden. Oh, ladies, I ain't done with you yet. Stop amening. (laughs) Because nobody wants to talk about the wife's job because everybody don't like that word. You know what that word is? Ephesians 5 says that a woman is supposed to... kick it with her husband. (laughs) Now, everybody struggles with this word, even though I defined it well, is that the word submit comes into play. But have you ever read verse 21, 22, 23, where it says submit to one another? 
So everybody takes this as a denigrating word, but if your husband loves you, he's going to submit to you too because he's going to serve you. So it's equal submission. But that doesn't excuse you from your submission. Oh, oh. <laughs> just because he's supposed to serve you doesn't mean you don't get to submit back. But it also tells you just one thing that nobody attaches to the word. It says, as to the fellas, I'm going to tell you this little secret. If you're single, watch this secret. If she's not submitting to the Lord, don't date her. Hear me out. No, I'm way off topic, y'all. We're going to get here. Because if she can't submit to an almighty God, why in the world would she submit to you? If she can't read her word and do what God called her to do on her singleness, you ain't no savior. You ain't Jesus. What you think? Your leadership's going to change her. I'm going to bring her to church. And then everybody begging the preacher to talk about this one word. He's like, please preach him on submission. Just one time. Say the word. I may have been legalistic with how I said that. Let me back up and make sure I say it the right way. I would be concerned. Even for a man, if he can't submit to the Lord, then here's the, here's the reverse, because everybody laughing at that one joke. Watch the reverse. If he's not submitting to the Lord, you better, be, you better run for life. Because then you're asked to submit to him. And he ain't even submitting to the Lord. He's supposed to be submitting to the Lord. You're supposed to be submitting to the Lord. That means everybody's in what? Submission. You're missing it. If two people are submitting as to the Lord, then guess what? We're all being led by the... So what's it hard to do? It's when two people forget where their initial submission is, then it becomes hard to do the structure of submission. Your marriage ain't jacked. Your relationship with God is. All right. Satan does a good job of distracting us. I went way off. But then she says some other dumb words that she... But from the fruit of the tree, watch these words. She doesn't say of good and evil. What does she say? In the middle. She gives the what? The geographical location, but not what it does. You're like, Pierre, why is that significant? Because why would you forget what it does and only give the location? It's because she was getting distracted already. She lost the significance of what would happen when she's fixing to do what she's fixing to do. She only called it the tree in the middle. She forgot that it was a tree of what? Knowledge of good and evil. You, some of us have lost the significance of the tree we're distracted by until you actually eat it. You just keep saying this man, this boyfriend, you didn't realize this man was leading you away from Christ because you lost the significance of why, what, what's in front of you. This sin, this issue, this pattern in my life, this, 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 you keep saying the thing. And God is like, no, 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 call it what it is. It's the thing that you're fixing to eat that's going to take you away from me. Be honest with yourself before you sin, ladies and gentlemen. Stop calling it the middle. It ain't gray. Just call it what it is. I'm fixing to eat from the tree that's forever going to separate me from God until Jesus Christ, until his covenant in the Old Testament. I'm fixing to eat it. So, Larry, how about we just start calling a tree a tree? Call it what it is. He says, you shall not eat from it, touch it, or you will die. I wish I had time for this, but Satan has a way of taking the one thing that we shouldn't do and making it like it's a simple sin. Until we realize the consequence of it. Here's the crazy thing about God is he's not living, he's not leaving mystery sins out there. Have you noticed that? He tells you what could happen if you do it. Don't honor your parents. Shorten your life. I mean, he's telling you. That's what I love about God. He's just, hey, man, if you don't choose to do it, that's on you. This is what happens. If you don't choose to do it, this is what happens. And then we, what's crazy is that you should celebrate the fact that even though he told you it was going to happen, some of us have lived a long life. But that's not just a, like God forgot about you. You're like, oops, man, I let them live long. <laughs> My fault. 
cut them down now. No, it's not. No. It's the fact that God gave you grace to live long even when you dishonor your parents. That's all it is. So it makes free will even more beautiful. I'm not going to, I promise every time I get on this pulpit, I will never dishonor my wife. But I'm finna get in trouble. My wife loves to clean. And because she loves to clean, there's always something that helps her clean better. I told you about the mop. Mm Mm-hmm. But then she sent me a picture. And you think, we have the, 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 the thing, the expensive vacuum, when you take off the wall and put it on the ground, has battery. No, I ain't a robot. She didn't like that. We didn't clean good enough. It wasn't a, look. What was it? I don't even know the word of this vacuum. But then she sent me another picture. This one was the same vacuum. <laughs> I'm going to get in so much trouble, y'all. Just know my wife is a cleaning freak. She loves to clean. So it's a good news that I'm finna get in trouble for. She says, but this vacuum has a green light so you can see the dust that is picking up. So just in case you miss a spot, you hit it with the green light. <laughs> and it picks up. And it can tell you what you've missed. So my dumb behind, I'm just going to go buy her a flashlight with a green light. <laughs> Baby, you need help? <sighs> we ain't got it. It's not the fact that the vacuum doesn't pick up dust anymore. (laughs) And it's not that it's broken. It's just that it comes with the green light. It's still the same $400 vacuum I bought previous. They don't lose value. It's not a car. Do its job. But God is saying, man, why would you even send me a picture? When I've given you the vacuum that does its job. So then I look at some of us and say, what what kind of pictures are you sending to God saying, God, I want this. And God's like, all Satan is doing is chunking a light on it. All you're getting distracted by is the fact that Satan just said, hey, you don't have a light, though. Hey, you don't have a light. If you had a light. You could buy another $400. And some of us have been caught in the buying cars, going after date after date after date, all because Satan keeps green lighting the fact that you don't have everything that your lust desires. Yeah. Yeah. That some of us, God is like, you don't need a green light. And you know why you don't need a green light? Because I still do my job in your life. You don't need a green light to show how much grace I've given you. I've given you enough grace. I do my job. It keeps doing my job. All I need you to do is pick it up and get to work and cultivate and keep. Stop worrying about what they say you don't have. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to look at your tree and I want you to give it a break. I need you to walk around the rest of this garden and realize our God is still a God of a garden. Because I didn't even get to the scriptures in Romans 5, 18. It talks about where one man sinned. Our Jesus died. You are free. Free from sin, free from the tree. You are free. I just want you to start making choices, not out of what you can't have, but everything he's given you to have. Let us pray. So for y'all in the sanctuary, before Chris sings, I want to do this. For those who have been distracted by your tree, your problem, your issue, your thing that God hasn't fixed yet, the thing that Satan keeps highlighting in your life that you aren't where you want to be and don't have enough of what you need or aren't happy in your season, today is your day to say, God, I'm free for the rest of the, I'm going to go in the rest of the, I'm walking away from the middle of the garden. I'm walking away from the tree. I, I'm not going to be distracted no more.
but what I can't do. I'm going to enjoy the freedom of what I can. Stop looking at God like he's a rule book when he's giving you freely to eat. Go eat. Enjoy the wife of your youth. Enjoy the husband that God has given you. Enjoy your singleness. Serve God in your singleness. Serve. Cultivate the ground while you have it to cultivate, and you ain't got to worry about no else. If this is your season, man, enjoy the season because you are free. Today, I want to set you free from the one thing you don't got and enjoy what you do. You got a relationship with God who's walking in the garden with you right now. This sermon's for you. I don't want to preach it again. I just want you to stand and say, God, I want to be free from. For those who are free, like St. Pierre, there's a tree in my life that is sinful. Just, it's a sinful tree. I keep going back to it. I keep eating from it. I know it's there. It's, people can't see it. It's in the privacy, whatever it may be. This is not me. Hear me out. This is not me asking for confession. I'm not your priest. Jesus is the high priest. But what this is, is you saying, God, I know I've been falling for the tree. I know I've let Satan trick me into what I don't have, and I forgot the rest of the garden. Today, I'm going to live free. If that's you today, I want you to stand, stand, and stand. The second thing I'll say is this. For those who have said, Pierre, you're right. I'm not really captivated by the tree, but I've gotten very complacent in my walk with God. I am sitting here. I don't keep. I don't cultivate. i just here in the garden just chilling. God's like, nah, today's your day to realize you've got to start cultivating and keeping. We want more from you. I put you in the garden to do something. Today is your day to do it. I pray that this message touched your life in a powerful way because this is what we're after. This is what we're focused on. That the message would not just impact your mind, but your heart so that you get to know Christ intimately. He becomes somebody you experience, not just know about. And that's why we want you to subscribe. We want you to subscribe because when you subscribe, when new messages come, it gives you a signal. And therefore, you know how to come back on and we grow together powerfully. You go to our website because when you do, you can find out about the book, Disciples in the Making. When that happens, it teaches you how to go from spiritual infancy to spiritual maturity and gives you all the steps to make that happen. So go on to our website and also give to this ministry. When you do, we're able to touch more lives all around the world that tune into this ministry for the glory of God. So you're able to make a definite impact that will change lives for God's glory. So subscribe. That way you continue to be involved and be a part of what God is doing, not just here at Living Room, but all around the world. You touch lives. God bless you. Stay focused.